field. Fastball hit in the air to left field. That's deep. That goes Chavez back near the wall. Leaping and he made the catch. He took a home run away from Roland. Trying to get back to first entrance. He's doubled off. And the inning is over. Andy Chavez saved the day. Eli throwing into traffic on the sideline. They're going to rule it a catch by Manningham. Sanchez, corner of the end zone. For the second time today, Santonio Holmes on the receiving end of a touchdown. This one with 10 seconds to play. This is WHPC Sports Talk on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. Welcome to the Tuesday edition of WHPC Sports Talk. On the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Host for today, Joshua Yamahi, joined by Brayton Daniello and Eric Williams. How are we doing, fellas? Um, the Rangers won so better. There's numbing the pain of the Jets being, well, I shouldn't say terrible. They lost to Buffalo, but no, I'm doing fine. I was about to ask, like, your Rangers won four straight. You're walking in here wearing the Rangers jersey. Like, why do you sound so despondent? Then you bring up the Jets. I'm like, oh, that makes yeah. sense. That makes perfect sense. So one, one, one of my teams is making me miserable because the Mets are signing everyone all of a sudden, so that's good. Yeah, we will definitely get to that because I've been hearing some, I've been hearing some chatter about some owners and some media members not too happy with Steve Cohen actually doing his job and spending money. Hmm, I <laughs> wonder why. So, that's interesting. Got too used to the coupons. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Now that it's the other way, they want to start bitching, but whatever. Uh, Eric, how are we doing? Yeah, um, and this sem- it's, it's the end of the semester, so. Uh, yeah, it's pretty tough right now. Yeah, we are. We're all going through it on campus here. <laughs> Only one week left, boys. One week. <laughs> well, it's a long stretch, but uh, yeah. we're gonna yeah. get through it. It's got. It's got to stick it out. Got to stick it out, and uh, hopefully, you know, if you're anything like me, you're always uh, playing the not the teacher's pet angle, but just keeping them close until you, you know, you might need that relationship at the last week of the uh, semester. But <laughs> we're all in the same boat there. But we are going to start sports wise. With the football teams, listen, I would start with, you know, happier things like the Knicks winning four straight, the Nets winning four straight as well, and leapfrogging to fourth in the East. The Rangers beating the red hot, well, not anymore, Devils, who won, who've lost two straight now after that mm-hmm. insane stretch. But uh, we'll, we'll start with the miserable uh, side of things in New York sports. We're going to start with the New York Jets that Braden mm-hmm. referenced. So, what can you say? The New York Jets are now seven and six. They were seven and four a few weeks ago, but. Two tough games. You lose a tough game in Minnesota. Very winnable. Uh, had had your chances, especially in the red zone. But you go one for six in the red zone in that game, you're not going to win often when that's the case. But, you know, it's all good. You, you're you going to Buffalo. You know, it's, it's a daunting task, but you've already beaten this team with an inspiring defensive performance. That was a game that Zach Wilson played and didn't play particularly well, even though he had his moments. But, hey, you, you're feeling good, especially when you're holding the Bills scoreless after one. But as the game goes on, Jets can't really get anything going. And Mike White, you know, the third quarter, he exits off of... I, I've never seen a legal hit like that. and I haven't seen a hit like that in a long time. Yeah, That Matt Milano put on him in the third quarter, just very clean. I'm not saying it's dirty, but to just launch your entire body way at a guy's rib cage. It took like two shots to the ribs also. Yeah, Mike White's going to be... He's, he's definitely still feeling that one after Sunday. I'm just going to read his stats off. 27 to 44, 268, 78.6 rating average. You know, he he did, you know, come back in the game and gut it out. Flacco came in for a series, didn't really give you anything. If I can't even no, say, I yeah, he gave you absolutely he nothing. He the ball so immediately after he came in. Well, yeah, there you go. He's he speaking of retirement home quarterbacks, that's a guy that needs to really yeah. <laughs> consider things, but the Jets, they're seven and six. We watched Monday Night Football last night. The Patriots also moved to seven and six because of Zach Wilson. Largely, the Patriots hold the tiebreaker over the New York Jets, mm. so they leapfrog the Jets in the standings. The Jets are now eighth in the AFC. There are seven spots, so that's not ideal. And as far as Mike White, Robert Sala says he's considered day to day with his rib injuries. So I'm going to come to you, Brayton. Mm. First, I'm going to ask you the. The feeling in Jets land right now, or you as a Jets fan, how are you feeling? And then I'm going to ask you, if Mike White, the injury concerns, obviously, if he can't go, how are you feeling about not just Sunday, but the rest of the season? Do you go back to Zach Wilson? We've already talked about Joe Flacco. Like, what do you do? Um, well, if you want how I'm feeling, um, I'll pull a 
great quote out of Ross Levine's book. I'm very indifferent. I mean, love you, Ross. But here's the th- if you want to be positive, which I am not normally, uh, th- the Jets have been in these last two games. They were in it against like a, a team like the Vikings and a team like Buffalo, one of the best teams in the NFC, one of the probably the best team in the AFC right now, unless you, you know, Kansas City is probably their own competition, I would assume. Mm-hmm. Well, Cincinnati's also up there because they beat Kansas City. Oh, now. they're definitely up there. But it's like you mentioned, Josh, that the, the red zone offense is alarming. And with the whole quarterback situation, I'm glad you brought it up. If this team doesn't make the playoffs, in my eyes, they don't have a quarterback. And you, you can make the argument they don't have a quarterback right now. You, right. Re- you really could, you know, in terms of what I think of the QB situation right now, um, Mike White is definitely, I think, the best option. I do think that if Robert Sala and, you know, Mike LaFleur and the coaching staff, they come together and decide that, you know, White isn't good to go this, you know, this coming Sunday against Detroit, I think Zach Wilson will have his, the, the ultimate shot at revenge to try and, not revenge, redemption, to get this team toward a playoff spot. You but know, go ahead. It's just I, I don't know. I, I really like I said they they've been in these games. If you want to be happy about it, like you know it's great. But you know you don't get style points. You don't get so loss is a loss. You know and no one's gonna you, you know they and, and the thing about it is so many of these games. I hope they do make the playoffs so I don't have to be sitting here at the end of week eighteen and talking about this. But if they miss the playoffs, you'll look back at the two New England games, and you'll look back at games like last week and the one before that and wonder what would have happened if XYZ happened compared to ABC. You know, that that's good points, uh, several good points, Braden. And, and by the way, I brought up the Jets falling to eighth. That's actually wrong because the Chargers also won that yeah. big win against Miami. So the Jets are now all of a sudden... It, it's it's all good. It was all good a few weeks ago, and then now you're looking at seven and six, and you're ninth in the AFC. So I don't know. As far as the Zach Wilson thing, listen. Once you lose your job in the NFL, because we all know it's merit based largely, but mm. you don't get many opportunities after you lose said job to get it back. So if Mike White is really hurting, and like we all saw that hit, like I. He's a, he might be a cyborg if he decides to play on Sunday. Yeah. Cuz that I feel like most of the fan base wants him to play. If if yeah. if, if Mike White doesn't dress, I as a fan, I don't expect this to happen. But as a fan, I want to see Zach Wilson come out like a man possessed and show me why it was a mistake for this franchise to start Mike White over him 3 weeks ago. I, do I think that's going to happen? I don't necessarily think that quite frankly if you ask me. If White is healthy, I still think Zach Wilson has played his last game as a Jet. I think we. Okay. I think if he comes back, week eighteen. You know, let's just say, let's just say he comes back. I think week eighteen. If this team misses the playoffs, they cut him right. Not they're not going to cut him, but they're done with him at that point. And then what this team does at quarterback over the off season is to be determined. Because it's like you say, it's like we say all the time. This defense gives this team a chance to win every week, and we saw it. Like you know, the last you know, it's seventeen points, the first meeting against Buffalo. You know, yeah. tw- 20, 20 just a couple days ago. It's like it's like we say, you're not going to stop Josh Allen. You're just going to limit him. The defense can limit him all he wants. If the offense can't do anything with it, it doesn't mean anything. And you know, we saw that. Zonovan Knight got into the end zone once, but other than that, this team in the red zone just the last two weeks has been egregious. And we've seen it full display. Is If it is Zach Wilson, obviously the Jets fans are going to put this kid on notice because like we've seen, and you just brought it up perfectly, if you just win one of those games against New England, you're in a much better spot today than you are right now. All you need to do is win one. He couldn't get both done, especially that last one in New England. Like, what can you say? You don't put up a single touchdown on offense and you lose last minute on a kick return, I know. But if you just play a little bit better, play like half of a number two pick, you're in a much better spot if you're the New York Jets. But he's probably going to have a better opportunity and another opportunity. We'll see if what he can do with it, if it is indeed... Mike White out and Wilson in because I think Flacco's a non-factor at this point, right? No, like he's, he's, I, I don't even no. like like like. Here's the thing: the funny thing about Sunday is the second that the second that Mike White gets hurt, and you know, obviously I see it coming because he got drilled at least twice just standing there. But the the second Flacco came in, it's like it's like it's like watching a corpse try to flip play football, Josh. It's really, <laughs> it's like I, I just see him stand there in the pocket, wait, and then he just gets a ball strip sacked from him, and it's like. Like, that's the one point where it's like, you know, if Zach Wilson was there, he could scramble out of the pocket and then try and make a play. But it didn't happen. I mean, 
I don't know. Because the thing about it is, as much as I'm against Zach Wilson at this point, I take him over Joe Flacco. So I don't know why in any world Joe Flacco is activated over Zach Wilson. Yeah, I thought when that first happened, that first game when Zach Wilson got benched, I thought it was going to be just, you know, we're teaching Zach a lesson. He's going to be inactive. But I, I agree with you. I would have rather had Zach Wilson come into that game. Have Chris Strudler in that game yeah. over Joe Flacco. I would have taken you. Would have taken Eric. I would have taken Nico. I would have taken Sean. I would have taken Franz. I would have taken anyone in this studio over Joe Flacco because anyone hey. would have known to, you know, not just stand there and you know, obviously. I was about to say taking me over Joe Flacco might be a bold claim, but after watching Joe Flacco that one series, I'm like, nah, I think that's accurate. <laughs> Listen, it doesn't get any easier for the Jets. You're, you're looking for a break in this upcoming schedule now. Even though you play the Lions and the Jaguars, two teams with right now losing records. They're still got, both hot. You got to look deeper into that because the Lions have won four or five now. Their offense is red hot. Like, if you're going to look at a, a key matchup in week 15 now, talk about the Jets' defense versus the Lions' offense. Yeah. that That's going to be a battle. And then the Jaguars, they've won a couple of, in a row. Trevor Lawrence is finally looking like that generational talent. So, but the saving grace is that both those games are home. But after that. You have to go to Miami. Got to go to no. Nope, before that, you got to go to Seattle too. Yeah, that's mm. on, on New Year's Day. That's that's <sighs> a tough four game stretch. So, the Jets, we know they have not just a great defense. I've called it a championship caliber defense. It's the best defense in the NFL. Uh, it's the it, it's it, it is the best defense in the NFL. And you want to know what the kicker is? Is this is the, again reasons like me and Dom always talked about why we sit here at the end of every year and we question QB. Because we don't know what the hell's going on there. We don't. And it's why everyone is calling for Lamar Jackson. It's why everyone's saying trade Zach Wilson. It's why everyone's fed up with Joe Flacco. I just... This, this, Josh, this team is a quarterback away from maybe being a Super Bowl contender. Clearly. Clearly. And they've drafted how many quarterbacks in the first round of the last decade? They haven't hit on one of them. Oh, Mark Sanchez, you know, and then Gino. Mark Sanchez, who they you know messed up because Rex Ryan won't get into that. Geno Smith, we know what happened there. Playing a lot better these Sam, days, Sam Darnold, I just have to say Adam Gase in the same sentence. We know what that is. <laughs> and now Zach Wilson, who has no excuses except for the fact that he was probably massively overrated. Yeah. Has literally has nothing. He has a competent coach. His, you know, you could talk all you want about his offensive line. The reason the games he lost in embarrassing fashion weren't due to his O line, though. He just completely stunk it up. He has, uh, you know, you want to talk about running backs. I mean, the Jets have had so much luck there between Brees Hall and now Zon of the Night. And then a wide receiver, it's not like you're not throwing the ball at anyone. Corey Davis, who unfortunately he exited with an injury Sunday, but hopefully I haven't read up anything lit. Hopefully that isn't serious. I don't need to see it. I'm Garrett Wilson, nothing needs to be said. He's one of the better rookie wide receivers in the NFL right now. There's no excuses. So, you know, I, and you know what, Josh? I, I'm getting tired of it. I, I, you know, and, and, and you know what's going to happen when they do miss the playoffs? Because that's what I think is going to happen at this point because I just have no confidence in this team at QB. I'm just going to sit back and say, oh, next year. I'm, I'm sick of waiting for next year. I've been waiting for next year for 12 years, Josh. For 12. <laughs> and, and you know what? I. I and it's because of events like what we have at QB now, and we're probably going to do nothing I, as much as I want to. We're not going to do anything to fix this situation. That's the reason why next year never comes because we, you know, we're so we're we're content. We're content with mediocrity at one position, and in turn, the whole team gets screwed as a result. Hey, it hasn't been great for the Jets at quarterback, definitely in the recent past, and especially now. But you got to look in the present if you're a Jets fan. Listen, if I would have told you at the start of the season that on December 13th. You're you got four games left to get in the playoffs at seven and six. You you definitely take that. I yeah, think, and, so. and that that's the thing. Every I feel I feel like, and this is myself too. Every Jets fan is like, oh, we want playoffs. It's like, yep, you got them. Like th- these are this is it. Th- these are the playoffs. These next four games, you could basically view them as playoff games. Yeah, th- this is your season. It's win right or go home. Win or go home. At least three of the four. Probably you could argue all four. Maybe. It's right there for the tanking, and like like we said, that Patriots win last night on Monday Night Football, and I got to bring this up. <laughs> it was trash seeing Kyler Murray go down that quick into the game. ACL injury. 90 seconds into the game. Yep. And again, I, I like to clown the Cardinals. We all do, but it, it's it's not what you want, especially when you're talking about maybe they get Sean Payton in the offseason. You're going with a healthy Kyler, and, and Isaiah Simmons is playing better on defense. They're, they're a top pick from a few years ago, so... Even though it's a disappointing season, things were looking up, but right now it just uh, doesn't look great for them. I don't think it's fair to to fire Cliff Kingsbury now. You think so? I don't think it's really fair because 
you got to think about it. His his like his whole offense hasn't really played together. Now Hollywood Brown and D Hop they only played two games together this whole season. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kyler Murray's been hurt, and now he's out for the rest of the season. I just don't think it's fair for him to get fired right now. Maybe after next season if everybody is healthy. But you look at it like. He's had to go with Colt McCoy. Colt McCoy is no back. He's not a bad no. backup at all. But to to sit there and think like, okay, you were going with the backup quarterback. I can understand why you lose those games. And then the game against the Patriots, like they they just have no offensive line as well. So it looked like turnstiles last night. <laughs> it really did. And and like you said. Um First, I'll address that point. Colt McCoy came in, put up some points, but then you give Bill Belichick a, a halftime break to really evaluate things and, and hone in on Colt McCoy is not much going to happen. And the Cardinals went scoreless in that second half. And the other point about Cliff Kingsbury, I don't know. Like, we can talk about if it's fair or not, if he's going to get fired, but I think it's a moot point. I just think, I think the GM and the coach right now, I think ownership is pretty much fed up with the entire thing. Now, is it right? You're right. They haven't played together their offense really all season long. You finally get Hollywood Brown and D-Hop on the field together last night, and then a minute in, Kyler Murray's gone. So, I, I don't know. I, I think I got to kind of agree with you that it's not fair, especially with, you know, who knows what they would have looked like if Kyler Murray finished out the season. But I think it's a moot point at this point. I think they're both gone, the GM and the coach. When, when the report came out that his, like, ACL was officially torn, I went, sh- like, instantly to the comments because I already knew what to expect. Right. Somebody said, I didn't even laugh at this. Like, it's not even funny at this point. Somebody said, it's Call of Duty time. I mean, technically they're not. If I suffer an ACL injury and I can't play quarterback, like, I'm playing Call of Duty. Like, I, I'm, yeah. I'm just saying. It's not funny, but it's It's accurate? the truth. It's the truth. Kyler's the probably the luckiest one. MW2 looks sick. <laughs> well, uh, whatever Kyler Murray is going to be doing when he's hurt, I hope he comes back soon. Because whatever you want to say about the guy, and, and people get their takes off a lot about him, he's definitely a great talent on the field. You yeah. can't deny that. So hopefully he gets healthy and he won't miss too much time into next season. Anytime you tear a ACL in December, it's a little tough, but hopefully he comes back soon next season. Let's uh, move on from the Jets to the Giants. But before I do, 516-572-7440. That's the number to call, football fans. We're talking New York football right now in the state of it. Uh, hint, it's not great because he had the New York Giants. I wrote on the topic sheet, they got their ass whooped, and then they got spanked, and they got kicked. Then they uh, got thrown down to the ground, spit on, uh, got dirt tossed on them. Everything, just about. Everything the, in the book. The Eagles did everything in the book to the New York Giants. It, it was such a... A, a, a terrible scene if you're a Giants fan right from the start of the game right from how the Eagles started they go up 21 nothing, obviously and then it just snowballed from there and Jalen Hurts yeah I, I thought listen the Eagles had the best record in the league but I thought Mahomes had the MVP lead a couple weeks ago like I, I wasn't even thinking about Jalen Hurts like that like it was a good conversation but it's I thought it was Mahomes award nah, now you look at the stats now He's got it. Jalen Hurts has thrown the ball. He's he's thrown that ball efficiently. Like you look at how many interceptions he has, and you could say he's not putting the ball out there a lot because he runs. But you know, throwing the ball this efficiently and nobody expected this out of you. It's just like okay, wow. Like hmm. how many passing touchdowns does he have? He has like I want to say like twenty two. Twenty two. I'm gonna read off his entire stat line right now. So it's 68% completion, 3150 yards passing. I haven't have his I don't even have his rushing yards up here. 22 uh passing touchdowns. Rushing yards is 686. Josh. That's so he's he's going to get to 1000 rushing yards. Yeah, probably. So maybe rushed for 10 touchdowns also. Actually, that's true because I don't know if they're going to play cuz the Eagles are one win away from locking up yeah, the Yeah, well, it depends what the Cowboys do. If the Cowboys right. take a loss the next week or two, you probably would sit your starters, I'd imagine, the last week or so if you can. I, I broke I broke it down yesterday, right? If the Cowboys beat the Eagles, they cannot rest their starters because if they do and they lose to the Giants in the last week, the Cowboys will get the first seed. Wow. So, technically, if you're the Giants, you're rooting for the Cowboys to beat the Eagles in that game. Or no, the other way. You're waiting. You're rooting for the Eagles to win, and then hopefully well, they rest their starters, and you won't have to see Jalen Hurts a second time. The last four, the first time he didn't go great. The last four weeks, you got Chicago this week coming up. Then you got 
your Cowboys, Eric, Week 16, followed by Josh's Saints. Oh, wow. Followed by the Giants to close out the season. So I won't even be watching that game. I'm out in the Saints. <laughs> <laughs> I, won't even be, I won't even be tuning in, bro. You want to see the Red Rocket? No, I'm good. I'm good. I am good. I am all the way good on the New Orleans Saints. But let's focus on the New York Giants. They are 7-5-1 and one now. Same record as the Commanders. But if you consider their 7-2 and two start, they've gone 0-3-1 and one since. It's not what you want, but you're still currently the seventh seed, and you have a huge game this week on Sunday Night Football. Sunday Night Football against the Washington Commanders. It's a loss. You think? Well, yeah, I have to agree. Listen, the Commanders are playing a lot better than the Giants, and they're a lot healthier than the Giants. So. And they're hot at back. the complete opposite time when the Giants were. Yep, and Chase Giants Young are... is going to come back, and yeah. you know we'll see that Andrew Thomas-Chase Young matchup should be something. But <sighs> this is why I asked the question a couple weeks ago where it was, do you still consider the Giants' season a success even if they miss the playoffs? Yes. You think so? Nobody expected them to like be all right. There were expectations for them to be like a mid level team, but nobody expected them to be seven and two through the midway point of the season. Yeah, but on the other side of that, if you start seven and two, like I, I feel, and you don't make the playoffs, that's got to be. Yeah, I feel like as outsiders looking in, we could say all this. I feel like if I'm a Giants fan, the season's a failure from just just based off where it started. Just because seven and two playoffs are in your sights, you think everything's fine, and then just. I mean, if they do miss the playoffs, it's got to be one of the worst second half collapses we've seen in the NFL. Yeah. So, I feel like as an as an outsider looking in, we like view it as like, oh, they you know they weren't predicted to do anything. They had a good season, but if I'm a f- if I'm a fan of the team, it's like um, I I'm not I'm not thrilled or happy really about starting seven and two and missing the playoffs. The the thing about it is though, the Giants were never really. Blowing out teams in the first place. Well, yeah, that's that's probably that that's an argument you can make as to why they're falling apart now. Probably, I think they haven't even won one single game by double digits. No, let me see, or one score. Every game they won has been yeah between like one possession. So (sighs) highest was eight points twice. Yeah, that's unbelievable. Seven, five, and one. You haven't beat down, not one single beat down. Yeah, keep my okay, and and if you want to just you know, I guess I don't want to discredit them. But beating teams like Houston, Chicago by eight. I mean, the Packers kind of fell off, but that was a signature win at the time. They beat them by five. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jacksonville, who has gotten their you know what together as of late, they beat them by six. I mean, you know the funny thing about that because we talk about the Giants' soft beat the, schedule. Beat the Panthers by three. Right, just three. We've talked about the Giants' schedule being easy as hell all year long, right? So why are you not at least, if you're the team that, you know, people like Corey David were saying with that team, how do you not beat the Panthers, the, the Chicago Bears, teams like that by, a, you, you don't have one single blowout to your record? Like this, that, that was a red flag the from la- the jump. It's the lack of skill. This is a team that is very, a lot of this, I, I don't want to say a lot of the success is off coaching, but... Listen, Brian Dable is a genius. He just needs the players now. And that's why they were talking about doing so much of the trade deadline. They didn't. And now the reality is it's probably going to come back to bite them in the ass. Yeah, I mean, I I, I honestly knew this was going to happen. They were going to fall and crumble because you're playing. You look at the second half of their schedule. You're playing NFC East teams five <coughs> times. Now, when, when it's kicked up like that at the end of the schedule, you, you, all right, you're playing Eagles. They took them to pound town. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> then then you got a tough Washington team. Who no, nobody knew they were going to rally like this, but they're doing it. You don't know. Th- listen, a division win, they might not get it. And that would be wild for a team that started 7-2, and two, and then you might miss the playoffs. You might finish with a losing record. You might finish with a winning record. You might be 8-1, eight, eight and one, like the definition of mid in today's mm-hmm. NFL, but... To not have not just one blowout win, but not one division win either, that, like, scratch all of that. Like, NFL teams, when they start in training camp, they talk about winning your division, winning the divisional games. For you to not win a single one, like, if I'm a Giants fan, I wouldn't even care about missing the playoffs. Just off pride, I got to have one division win. Mm -hmm. And I don't want it to be against the Eagles B team in Week 18. Yeah. (laughs) So... The New York Giants, what can you say? They're still they still control their own destiny. If they went out, they're in. But, but I, I will say we're, we're gonna find out. Like even with the acquisitions they'll have in the off season and everything, we're gonna find out if they're a real team next season because we play the AFC East next season. Yeah, that's 
We're going to find out, and the Giants will be more talented with the money they have to spend, and Joe Shane can finally not be held back by the sins of Dave Gettleman and put the roster together his way. So we'll see what happens. The Giants' remaining schedule reads off as at the Commanders this week, Sunday night, like I said, at the Vikings, which, you know, they're 10-3, and three, but is it a real 10-3? and three? I think the Vikings are every bit as fake as the Giants are. I don't know anymore. I, I don't. I, I thought this team had Super Bowl aspirations <laughs> until <laughs> Eric's Cowboys walked into Minneapolis and, like Eric said, put, took them to Pound Town. Yeah. So after that, <laughs> they haven't looked. I mean, you lose that game. I know Detroit's hot, but really, yeah. you don't look competitive against the Detroit Lions as a ten and two, now ten and three football team. Like that's tough. If you're like a team like Washington or Seattle that's fighting to get in the playoffs, or even Detroit, and you look at the playoff standings and you're like, all right, maybe we can get the six seed, maybe play uh, the Vikings, or this, or we can get the seven seed, play the Vikings. You, you're thinking like, okay, we can go in here and beat them. Because right. they're not a strong team at all. They're they're not. They have names like Kirk Cousins and Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen and Dalvin Cook and on defense Harrison Smith and all those guys. But they haven't won by more than one possession, I think, all year too. So, but that's a very winnable game, like you said, Eric. They're at the Vikings. Then they host uh, the Fighting Jeff Saturdays, the Colts, looking very winnable. And then the Eagles' last game of the year. We'll we'll see what they do. As far as the NFC playoff picture, it does have the Giants still in. The Commanders are the sixth seed. But if you look at the Commanders ahead of them and the Lions and Seahawks right behind them, the Lions and Seahawks have the tiebreak over them because they beat them head-to-head. So if you're the Giants, like that's if you want to talk about this team potentially making the playoffs, that doesn't bode well either. You let the Lions and the Seahawks beat you, and they're right behind you. And if they finish with the – well, they're not going to finish with the same record as the Giants because of that tie, but – if you let them pass you up because of head-to-head wins against teams that we thought, at least earlier in the year, you were definitely better than, that's, that's going to sting if you're a Giants fan. I don't care what you say about, oh, we didn't expect much coming into the season. We had Corey David here talking about nine wins from the jump. And they still might get there. But if there's no playoffs, how much does it really matter? So we'll see what happens. Um, I think that's it for the football talk. I don't know what news and notes I want to get to. I know uh, Mike Leach, the uh, the college football head coach, uh, he passed away today at 61. You know, I, I saw an ESPN special on him. He was, because uh, you know in the world of like Nick Sabans and stuff where they just kind of mm-hmm. give boring answers and play it safe for the media. This guy was like, always mm-hmm. had a funny, yeah. witty answer for the media. They so, say he was very political too. Like he didn't hold back on anything that he believed in. Yeah, I mean, listen. Whatever uh, whatever you believe in, I, I do respect a person like that. You know, if you're going to be yourself, be yourself all the way. So I, it definitely hurts to have him gone at 61 years old. Rest in peace. Um, let me actually update the entire NFC and AFC playoff picture. So I read off the AFC earlier. Well, I read off the Jets portion. So the AFC looks like the Bills are back in the one seed. All of a sudden, they're back after struggling for a little bit. They lose that insane game to the Vikings. Well, they're back in the one seed. Chiefs are the two seed after that uh, win against the Broncos. The Ravens are the three seed. I don't know how long that's going to last with Lamar Jackson being down and Corey's guy, Tyler Huntley. But we'll see. The Titans, meh, 7-6, four seed. Wild cards read as the Bengals, the Dolphins, and the Patriots. So there you go in the AFC. The NFC, Eagles, the one seed, Vikings, followed by the Red Hot 49ers. The three seed, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are the fourth seed. They don't deserve to even. The Panthers might actually make the playoffs. They they control their own destiny. If the Panthers win out, they're in. And they already beat the Buccaneers head-to-head. So, I, mean, I, I watch Tampa Bay. Like, there's nothing inspiring about this team. All you can really say is, oh, Tom Brady, and that's it. I'll tell you what. Yeah, well, I, even he hasn't looked good. No. I wouldn't care what NFC South team made it. I know if we don't get the first seed, it's finger looking good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even as a Saints fan, like what can I say? We're last in this dog water division. We're last. Last place. You don't have your first either, do you? It's with mm. oh, don't get me going, Braden. Guess what that is. Listen, the Knicks of the Knicks have won four straight. I don't need to be yelling on the radio today. Don't get me started, Braden. But yes, you're Fair right. Enough. They don't they don't have their first round pick. It's looking bad. Well at least we'll trade Sean Payton. Maybe get something <laughs> for him. 
But the Cowboys are the top wild card. They're the five seed, but they still have a chance to win that division. It's it's definitely alive. It's going to be a, you know what, Christmas Eve, that's going to be a really good game. Yeah. But it's going to be so tough. Like, we, we've lost two starting cornerbacks. We've now lost our right tackle for the season. We've lost Jonathan Hankins, who was out for the regular season now. He was playing well, too, like on a team that struggled to stop the run. Mm-hmm. He was really doing that job for them. Yeah, so next man up. Yeah. But uh, acquired T.Y. Hilton. I don't know what he can really give you, but uh, maybe a few <coughs> catches here and there. Does that take you guys out of the Odell Beckham sweepstakes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's over. Who knows where Odell will wind up now, but like we said, the Commanders are the sixth seed and the Giants are the seventh seed. So, four weeks left to go. Every team's had their bye week. It's time for the stretch run. Uh, shout out my fantasy football team for making the playoffs in my money league. So, sorry, I just had to get that off. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm, in, I'm in the playoffs too, so. Money league or no? Money league, yes. Ooh. Get that bread, Brady. 11 and 2 in the regular season. 11 oh, and 2. My God. Hopefully, I don't pull up Packers. Damn. Had to, he not even here, bro. He had to throw a shot at Nico. He exactly. here. Was not here. I had to. <laughs> Absolutely necessary. <laughs> you are listening to WHPC Sports Talk on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. It's Joshua Yamahi joined by Brayton Daniello and Eric Williams. Well, when I've been hosting, we haven't talked much baseball lately, but there's a certain team in Queens. Thank God. That's been inspiring me. Because you mentioned it, Brayton. <clears throat> In the Wilpon era, otherwise known as the Coupon era. Screw them. Could you imagine? Night mentality. Could you imagine spending this much money in one single summer or winter, or whatever? You want to know the funniest thing about the coup about the Coupon era? Yeah. It's it's not even that they didn't. They forget about spending a lot of money. But when they did, when they did spend like a big contract or something like here or there, it would blow up in their face. And I I, I just need to say two words: Yo, Ennis Cespedes. <laughs> That's about it. And the whole what what was the injury? What he got on his ranch with a boar or some like a boar accident or was it yeah, a horse accident? Weird like it, it was like five different stories than him not showing up. I you know Wilson uh, Wilson Ramos actually played good, but between all the Todd Frazier's and all like the little minor signings, I'm so happy that this team finally finally has an owner that's willing to spend. Because you know what? It, it hit me the other day, Josh. The realization: Steve Cohen is just. The richest Mets fan. Think about it. He really is. He really. really. He, he, he wants the team to succeed, and he's willing to spend whatever it takes to do so. And if, if you're a fan, you have to love it. I mean, my God almighty. It's like, look at the contracts he's handed out in the last... David Robinson for the bullpen, which was egregious last year. We don't even need to get into that other than Diaz. Um... Quintana, who should boast, bolster your rotation with Chris Bassett gone now, and we'll get into another guy. Uh, extended bread in Nimmo, which I loved. And, you know, everyone was saying it's an overpay. Like, if it's, if it's an overpay, okay. But, you know, Scott Boris, I, I was hearing $25 million. I'll take the 20.25. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Senga for five years, $75 million, who left off for... Uh, h- how many free agents in the uh, in the Wilpon era, Josh, uh, left money on the table from other teams to go join the Mets? Oh, not a one. Exactly. Not a one. Says a lot, right? You know, it's a new day. It's a new day if you're a Mets fan, and every Mets fan should be celebrating that. Let's let, let's just read off what they've done again this offseason. So you lose to Grom, uh, boo-hoo, but enjoy Texas. Because he, ch- he, he, he wanted to win. He wanted to win. That's why he went to Texas. First off, he's not going to be healthy. And you know what? The thing about it is it hit me the other day. DeGrom leaves. I don't care. <laughs> I like don't I, 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 really I like don't. to be honest. Listen, I, really I like the Grom. I like him as a as a player. I like him as you know an athlete. Like him as a person. But I'm just I'm not giving you that because you're not going to be healthy those next five years. Texas did it because they have made no progress. And in the back of their minds, they see this guy who has won two Cy, he won two Cy Youngs, and you know it's cute and all that. You think that's still going to be relevant now in 2023. They saw that and they think, oh, we have a bunch of money to spend. Why not go get him? For the problem, and the thing about it is, if it was a Verlander contract, that wouldn't be the bad deal. And, and to be honest, I'd probably take Degrom back on a Verlander contract because it's two years. It's a low risk, high reward. Maybe he's, you know, maybe he gives you a World Series or two. But he's not doing anything one in that division, and two, he's not going to be healthy the next five years. But regardless of the fact, I have to thank Degrom. Because whatever you said after the fact, whether it was just you not re-signing, or maybe it was something you said, or God knows what else, maybe it was saying that you know you didn't give the Mets a chance to give a final offer, 
Whatever you did, thank you, DeGrom, because whatever you did triggered Steve Cohen to the point where he just said, all right, screw it. I'm signing whatever I can see. And whatever he looked at was immediately just, poof, it's in a Mets uniform now. And, and the funniest thing about it is we're sitting here, we're talking about it, and like, you think the Mets are done. Oh, they're not done. They are being in, you know, I know they're in conversation with an outside shot with Carlos Correa. They're looking for a jerks and Profar maybe in the outfield. This offseason is still very young, and that's, that's the most hilarious part about it, what they've added, and there's still all this time left. Verlander, Kitano, Kodai Senga from Japan. Not just that in the rotation, but the bullpen, David Robertson, who kind of went under the radar with the Nemo signing. I wanted him last year at the trade deadline, so that's a good signing, yeah. in my opinion. Great signing for one year, $10 million, I'll take it. Mm. And then you trade for Brooks Raley, who has nasty stuff, a left-handed mm. specialist from Tampa Bay. And you bring back Edwin Diaz, and, and we've already talked about that. You still might bring back Adam Adovino. Uh, the team hasn't ruled that out. You know, it, it's a great start to the offseason. We all know that. But what I really want to get to is certain owners and reports from like Jeff Passan oh, and, and guys that just whispering about, oh, this is so wrong. The Mets are spending all this money. The small markets can't compete. Yeah, you know what the, th- uh, the thing about it, Josh, if, if the Yankees did this, no one would start bitching about it. But you know what? Because everyone is not used to the Mets being in a scenario like this. Everyone wants to see the Mets fail because that's all they've done since 86. So we don't need to be reminded of that. But because everyone's so used to it, they don't, wa- they don't want times to change. But Unfortunately for everyone that's listening to me, times are changing because the Mets are spending money at everything. The Yankees are not. So if it's just Yankees, if it's, is it just Yankees fans or is it more like baseball fans in general? I, you know what's funny? Because I, I feel like the majority are just salty Yankee fans. I was listening to, and I never do this, but I was listening to the Michael K show a little bit on the way in. Mm. And this guy, Michael K, like he's trying to frame it like... Oh, I, I wasn't talking about... Oh, I'm not critical of Steve Cohen. Like, I love the guy. Blah, blah, blah. Mm, typical radio yeah, stuff. Sure. But it's like, oh, but, you know, the small market teams and he there's going to be another lockout in five years because of Steve Cohen. I'm just like, yo, like, what do you expect? And first of all, to tell us to Mets fans who lived through the Wilpon era... Dude, the team, you're not paying... A, money. You're, Michael, the, the team you call is paying a billion dollars combined to Garrett Cole, Giancarlo <laughs> Stanton, and Aaron Judge. What are you talking about? I, 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 what are you talking about? But the Mets are the bad guy because in one offseason after they lose, that's a, the that's a part everyone's forgetting. They lost their, their, their piece de resistance. They yeah. lost their crown jewel. I bet they, I bet they don't wish that DeGrom would have left now. Maybe you know, Steve Cohen would have gotten triggered and then did all this. You know maybe. what? Maybe. Maybe, because you have, you, this guy leaves, Jacob DeGrom, and what do you expect Steve Cohen to do? Just lie down and forget yeah, about it? he has to do something. So, well, Billy Epler has to, he's going to give Billy Epler the money to do anything. It's on Billy to go make the move, and he did a damn good job. Look at what he brought in, and what, the last week, essentially? He brought in Verlander, he brought in Sengo, so immediately DeGrom's, the, the mass, well, I shouldn't say massive, because he's no longer what he used to be, but the hole that DeGrom left in your rotation is immediately filled, you know, you go to the bullpen, get Rayleigh and Robertson. You gotta love that. Quintana also for the rotation. Forgot to mention that. And you extended Nimmo, so you, center field is locked down for the next eight years. So yeah, it, it's like you said. What do you expect us to do? Nothing. It's like you, you like Steve Cohen didn't just buy the Mets to just sit on his ass like you know the Wilpons did. He yeah. bought it with the intention of making this team a winner. He's gonna do, and that, and this is what this is. He is doing everything in his power to make a winner. If other teams have a problem with it, I quite frankly don't care. And, and Steve Cohen is saying the same thing, by the way. Oh, absolutely. And I, I got to ask Eric, as you're a Dodgers fan, a question real quick. Because I don't remember, maybe because I'm not a Dodgers fan, I wouldn't know. But people are really crying about this Mets and their spending and the names they're bringing in. Like, were people, because we know the Dodgers, like what they like to do. Mm-hmm. So were people really crying this much about the Dodgers you bring in? Like, no. So. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> It's okay when they do it, but it's a problem when I do it. Like, because what people, are we talking people about? are used to the Dodgers and the Yankees doing that. They're not used to the Mets because the Mets haven't been spending money. Even even when they made the World Series in 2015, they didn't spend a lot of money, Josh. They didn't. Yeah. So now, it's because it's a new era, people aren't used to this. People are going to cry about it. And quite frankly, I don't care. I welcome it. Hate us. Please, hate us. Yeah. You can... You can uh they can really hate all they want. Listen, I know my team's going to be... Uh, actually, I don't know what they're going to do, but I know my owner's putting my team in the best position possible to win a championship. And if you're an owner of any sports team, that's what you ask for. That's where it starts. Yeah. why the Knicks have struggled so much with Dolan. You know, you don't have a competent owner at the top. Why is the franchise going to go anywhere if they can't? 
Jerry Jones is just an old fart. <laughs> <laughs> glory hole. Glory hole. He just wants some glory hole, Eric. I still can't believe that's a real soundbite, bro. I can't believe he said that. What, did he, <laughs> what was his expectation when he said that? How do you think that was going to be presented? What does it mean, Eric? Whoa, we going we gonna to get into that? No, what, I mean, no, like, because of- there's a, obviously a phrase to I, I don't know what it means. What does Glory Hole in Jerry Jones' day, oh. the whole picture <laughs> thing, what does that mean, you think? It must be an Arkansas thing. Must has be. to be. It must be. It must be an Arkansas Maybe thing. Maybe it has something to do with the corner. I haven't been there lately, though. Oh, you haven't been there lately? Nah. Oh, well. That's, it's, uh, been, it's been occupied. It's been, <laughs> it's been occupied, huh? I wonder if I have this Jerry Jones soundbite in here. It's got to be in there somewhere. Yeah. I still don't know what, like, he obviously, bro, he is not up to, like, I don't want to say the trends nowadays, but just, like, <laughs> it's just so. Oh, I found it. I found oh, boy. It. Uh, I think that's a part of leadership is to have some of the guys that have gone before that uh, have been disappointed uh, to share it with everybody involved. For me, it's a reminder. I, too, have been here 23 years. And uh, it is a reminder, I've been here when it was glory hole days, and I've been here when it wasn't. And so having said that, uh, uh, I want me some glory hole. You just, you can hear the conviction in his voice. He he didn't even have to say that. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I understood what what he meant when he first said it, but he did not have to say that at the end. He really didn't. (laughs) I want me some glory hole. He really didn't. Like, we didn't need that, Jerry Jones. We don't need that. Like, you could have parked that. Oh, God. He wanted him some glory hole. He wanted the world to hear it, right? <laughs> Let's move on to the New York Knicks. Like, who I said. Bing bong. Bing bong. Bing bong. Bing bong. That's four straight bing bongs for four straight wins in Madison Square Garden. And typically, I'm over here. You can hear me typically on Thursday. There's something about the Thursday show talking about the Knicks. It just Greatest drives me crazy. Ever. Drives me crazy. Drives me a little crazy. I just got to start yelling at stuff. But Probably because I antagonize you to the point uh, where I get you screaming about it. Uh, you, you and Mauricio. Uh, yeah. yeah. Me and Mauricio, yes. Um, <laughs> but the Knicks, they've won four straight games, you know, after they dropped to 10 and 13, after they allow a million points to the Mavericks in the second half. I'm looking at that Cavs game where Donovan Mitchell is coming in, and I'm like, this is going to be it for Tibbs. Donovan Mitchell's going to come in, who Leon Rose could have had. We talked about it ad nauseum. He could have had him, but punted, stuck with R.J. Barrett and the crew, and Spider's going to drop 50 on the Madison Square Garden floor, and that's going to be that. Well, it hasn't quite worked out that way. They beat the Cavs. Then they beat three more teams, including... You know, a great win the last time we saw them on the court versus the Kings, who are really playing well in the West. I know they didn't have De'Aaron Fox, but listen, Julius Randle, I got to give credit where it's due. And I'm, I'm the first to criticize the Knicks when they do poorly. I got to give credit where it's due on this front because Julius Randle is playing like an all-star again. Jalen Brunson is playing like an all-star point guard in New York City. We haven't seen that since ever. Well, as far as I can remember. And I'm a Knicks fan right out the womb, like y'all know. I was saying bing bong out the womb. But um, listen, it, it's all good vibes right now. Um, I know Cam Reddish, Evan Fournier, Derrick Rose are notable guys that aren't in rotation. So you're expecting some moves to be made on that front. And I, I hate the fact that Cam Reddish isn't in the rotation right now because I really believe he could be providing the Knicks something. But ever since, and I, I brought up that Cavs game because what's interesting, something that happened. Tibbs takes out Derrick Rose. Takes out Cam Reddish. Goes to a nine-man rotation. In comes Deuce McBride. Now, if you look at Deuce McBride's stats, he was a second-round pick last year. If you look at his stats, they don't fly off the page. But what he does is everything the Knicks have been missing. Three-point defense. Defensive rebounding. Defensive playmaking. Offensive playmaking. Three-point shooting. Like He's done everything that you could have asked for and I got from a guy that wasn't in the rotation earlier this year. And they're 14-13. and 13. All of a sudden, they're six in the East. They play the Bulls two straight games on Wednesday and Friday in Chicago. Now, Jalen Brunson is questionable for tomorrow's game with that. that uh, Tibbs is calling it a foot contusion. But I, I think I got to ask the question. Has Tibbs officially saved his job? Not just right now, but for the entire season with this four-game winning streak. Hmm. It's just four games. Yeah. He can go on a 12-game losing streak. You never know. You never know with Tom Thibodeau. You really Harry don't. Toenail himself. See, I'm not going to call him that because he's won four straight games. You're just an idea, though. He's he's an idea. He's an idea. The beard isn't a good look, but 
It is for some, but not for others. Uh, but Tibbs, I, I think you're right. He, he's definitely shown Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde or whatever it is the other way around. I didn't pay attention in uh, whatever class it was taught in. but Dr. Jekyll's the evil one, I think. Doctor, Okay. Okay. And then Mr. Hyde is the nice one. So mo- most of the time he's been Dr. Jekyll. Yeah. Okay. Well, he could he's, turn he's back into to, that. He's trying to hide it, but he might turn back into Dr. Jekyll real soon. He's going to grow a beard and think we forgot what we know about him. But uh, listen, he's coming back. It's a homecoming at Chicago for two games. And listen, I, I just brought up the Deuce McBride thing. But Eric, I got to ask you this because you talked about Cam Reddish for your sons. Uh, Evan Fournier was linked to the Lakers in a deal that might bring back Pat Bev and Kendrick Nunn. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not really. That doesn't really move that, me. Yeah, that's not thrilling at no, all. No, not at all. Ooh, but Cam Reddish, like, and Derrick Rose, even like that's <laughs> that's an interesting. There are two interesting players that can really help a team, especially a playoff team like the Suns, like the the Warriors and the Bucks and teams like that that are trying to do something in the playoffs, and they're out of the Knicks rotation. So The Suns desperately need scoring off the bench. Like It's like you watch these games, and I, I've been watching these games ever since the, the 2021 playoffs where they made the finals. It's like Brooklyn comes off the court. You have CP3 out there, but can he really – score the ball like Booker no he's, so he's a good point guard yeah. still but him scoring like those two games versus the Pelicans like you gotta give me more and it's just like mm, you don't have anything else to get out like there's nobody else that can really score the ball I mean you have Bridges you got Cam Johnson he's out but to like put your foot down and just say nah give me the rock I'm gonna go and get that bucket Cam Reddish is that guy. Yeah, He's he is. Guy. And then you have Derrick Rose. That that would definitely help. But I don't know if it's enough to make a championship run. But I like Kuzma a lot. He's That's the name. It's like you read my mind. That's exactly the name I was going to bring up today. Because not only is he linked to the Suns who really need a four, especially with Cam Johnson being hurt and Jay Crowder's on the way out. He's been linked to the Knicks too and the Lakers. Kyle Kuzma. Who, if you look and you, you recognize the name, it's like, okay, last time we really saw him in the National Eye, he was the maybe the third best player on the Lakers team that won in the bubble. And But you look at you look at what he's doing in Washington. This is a quality NBA player. Yeah. So I think he's a quality NBA player, actually, that would help a team's defense a lot. He can score from everywhere. He's a three-level scorer. Like, those in the NBA don't grow on trees. Mm-mm. So I think... Between those three teams, especially the Knicks, at least in my perspective, I could see him fitting seamlessly on all three of those teams. So it's going to be interesting to see where he winds up. It's Listen, it's December 13th now. This is what the time of year where you usually start to see some trades start to happen. And a lot of teams got a lot of needs, Knicks included. So we'll see what happens with them. Also the Brooklyn Nets, uh, they've won four straight too, but... Yeah, you're 17 and 12 with Kyrie, KD, and Ben Simmons. Like this Impressive. is what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, like good, good for them. Uh, Kevin Durant, 30 points, nine rebounds, six assists last night. Kyrie with 24, six and five. Ben Simmons, 10, eight and five. He's back playing after that um, knee injury. Real quick, do we think this team's legit contenders in the East? Now, before you answer that, the Celtics have lost two straight, but they've still been that team all season long. The Bucks, we've seen what they've done in the playoffs in the past. Are the Nets right there? No. They're not better than the 76ers. Um, they're probably like the fifth best team in the East. Right now they're the four seed. and So let me, let me read off the Eastern Conference standings real quick and then we'll make a better decision or have more insight on it. So the Celtics, Bucks, Cavaliers, Nets, those are the four seeds, four top seeds. <laughs> Sixers, Knicks, Hawks, Pacers, Raptors, Heat. So if you look at where the Nets are, I, I agree with you. I think the Sixers are better than them. But are they better than the Cavaliers? I wouldn't say so. That's you, why I, like, I put them in like, that five spot. Yeah, if you're the five seed too, like, you might have to go to Philly. And you're going to need Ben Simmons in a playoff series. And Ben Simmons is going to have to. I can't. Actually, I just had an idea. I would love to see that. I would love to see Ben Simmons back in a playoff setting in Philadelphia. <laughs> He'll one play more time. a minute and go back to the corner of the bench. Uh, I, I would love to see that. I would love to see that. I, I just, I actually, because I just thought about it, I need it. I need it. I need to see it. I would like to see it. 
But the Nets, like, they're red hot. Like we've said, let me look at their upcoming schedule here. They're playing good ball. Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving's back on the court now. Uh, Ben Simmons is back on the court. You know, you never know when Kyrie might take another break from playing. But looking at their schedule, you got the Raptors, who are beatable. Pistons, who just lost Kate Cunningham for the year. Oh, man. That's tough. When Bayama. Yeah. They definitely <laughs> pushed all their chips in. Detroit is 7-22. and 22. They're definitely leading the Wemby sweepstakes. And after that game, they have the Warriors, and that's due, and then the, it gets tough. You got the Bucks, Cavs, Hawks, and then you finish up with another winnable game. You finish up December, actually, with a game against the Hornets in Charlotte. So it's an opportunity for the Nets. They have a lot of high uh, leverage, high quality, high profile games here. They have a chance. They can put you know, put people on notice on the national stage and... We'll see if they actually can make a run here and, and get out of the uh, mediocrity they've been in the last two years. But to uh, to to keep on that track of like New York basketball, last night, Christ the King, Sierra <laughs> Canyon. Oh man, that was yeah. Talk about that, please. I I sat there and watched that game and I was like, man, I gotta go to sleep. Like, cause I, I woke <laughs> up early and went to the gym this morning. I was just like, nah, I got plans to go in the gym. Like, I, I gotta go to bed. And that's why I'm so tired right now because I stayed up for that whole game. Like, it was just, it's phenomenal watching like these legend sons. Like, they they just out there really playing ball right now. That's crazy. Like, Kyan Anthony is 15 years old. He is six three. Not even fully grown into his body. Yeah. He had eight points last night. Made a few plays. Once he like fully grows into his body, he'll he'll be a problem. Absolutely, and then you had Bronny, LeBron James' son, obviously LeBron James Jr. Mm. If you know, <laughs> <laughs> twelve point six rebounds and three assists in the win. So that that was something. You're usually not tuned into high school hoops like that, but it was definitely a scene. LeBron James, Carmelo Anthony's sons going at it. That that's a moment. That's yeah, a moment in time. That really is. And you speak about Carmelo's son. Like, I remember him when he was, like, five, six years, mm-hmm. seven years old when he was a Nick. First off, I felt old as hell <laughs> watching that. I'm like, man, damn, this kid's 6'3". Yo. That's crazy. Unbelievable. It, wow. So, I, I, I think they both got bright features ahead of them. I know it's easy to say that because they're Carmelo Anthony and LeBron James' sons, but they got some talent. They got some talent, and like Eric just said, they haven't even grown to their bodies yet, and they're that skilled. Yeah. So... Got to watch out for that. And we'll see how the Knicks and Nets do as they move forward in the next week. Uh, Bing bong. Let's go Knicks. Keep it going. Get me two wins in Chicago and then we'll start talking. Well, it's time, Brayton. You know, you usually come in here on Tuesdays. Not so happy. Not so happy about the New York Rangers. But don't you know it. They've won three straight before last night. Who's coming into town? Who's coming into the garden? Devils. The New uh, Jersey Devils. <laughs> what happened? Uh, is Talk the only way it. I could put. Um, for, well, the, the game was actually the polar opposite of their first meeting against New Jersey, which they started off great against New Jersey the first time, then they completely fell apart. It was the complete opposite. Um, Jacob Truba, well, if Nico was here, he'd rant all over him as I say his name. Made a bad defensive play on the second goal. The first goal was just an unfortunate bounce. Um, they went down 3-1. And then um, the, the most ironic thing possible, something that Nico would also say if he was here right now. In the most ironic way possible, the kids doing everything they can to save Gerard Gallant's job by busting their asses every five seconds trying to win this game. So, there's a parallel I'm seeing here mm. with uh, Gerard Gallant and Tom Thibodeau. Hmm. You kind of see where I'm going? Like, yeah, the not... kids saving their jobs? Yeah. It's funny how that works. I don't know. Something about the building, maybe. The fact yeah. both teams are at MSG. The fact both teams struggled to start an hour, like, trying to actually like get it back on track. I don't know. But, not nah, listen, it's a good win. It's a big win. They get it done in overtime. Um... Yeah, they've won four straight, and the thing about it is, you know, people could put a win beside the Colorado asterisk all they want about how McKinnon and Landis Gog didn't play. You know, that that's cute. I don't really care. Georgiev can go screw himself. But, no, nah, they've looked good in the last week. Between the 6-4 win against St. Louis to having a dominant, they're a very dominant third period team. Well, they didn't show it last night, but... They scored three in the third period against St. Louis to win 6-4. They scored four against Vegas last Wednesday to win 5-1. 
Colorado. The, the last two, ironically, the last two games they didn't play their best third periods. I was against obviously the Devils last night in Colorado, but they got it done both times in overtime, and then Friday night they got it done in a shootout. So they look good. Um, has my opinion changed on it? Um, I'd like to see a little bit more because it's a long season to go. They're fifteen, ten, and five, and this is obviously this six, these six games, the six game stretch starting with St. Louis and they'll finish up with Toronto and Philadelphia. Me and Nico alluded to it. It's big and you know, for the first four games they've come out and they've delivered. Now, if you could really shut down Toronto and a guy who's been great like Mitch Marner who's on like a twenty two game point streak, I think. Between that, Austin Matthews, William Nylander, Morgan Riley at the defense, if you can get them to shut down, they're really gonna have me teetering back in the direction of okay, this team can definitely make noise. Now let's go do it. So they got Toronto Thursday this weekend. Hopefully they'll be able to finish. You know, it, it's ironic they start they play teams like New Jersey so great because then we have games like Philadelphia and Chicago, which I should look at it like all right. If we play even an ounce like this, it should be an easy win. But this team is very engageable early on. So hopefully, hopefully they'll keep up. Hopefully they'll keep winning. I swear I hear you talk about the Rangers, and it's like you're describing the the Ice Knicks, the Hockey Knicks. Yeah, because that, that's exactly what it is for the New York Knicks as well. Oh, real quick before we get out of here. So the Islanders hit the ice. They're seventeen and twelve. Mm. They hit Boston, who is now they replaced the Devils as the best team yeah. in the East. So how are we feeling about that game? Um, it'll probably come down to the goal, which it should be a good goaltending matchup because Linus Elmark is like sixteen and one this season. He has Vezina numbers through those seventeen starts. I assume the Islanders will be playing Sorokin. It's um. It'll be a tough game. I would rule the honors out, but they just beat New Jersey 6-4 the other night in New Jersey, so they've proven they can beat the top teams in the in the league. So it'll be an interesting game, probably a goaltender's matchup. I mean, I'd probably give Boston the edge in offense, but the honors proven they could score against the top teams like we just saw the other night. So it'll be an interesting game. Um, I don't just need... Listen, they need... <laughs> I don't, I don't want to say throw the season away, but I just I don't <laughs> think they have the youth. I don't think they have the coach, but I'm an outsider looking in, so I, I, I won't judge. Ho- hopefully they can get it done. You're an objective Rangers fan, is what you are. That's all I am. <laughs> just well, an idea. Just an idea. Well, what have we learned today? We've learned that uh, it's all good, positive vibes mostly in New York sports, except if you're a football fan right now. Mm. But listen, the Giants and Jets both control their own destiny, and we will see what happens there. But for now, yeah, we're going to call it a show. Stay tuned. Keep it locked on 90.3 WHPC for a German Hit Parade. And then the Nassau Lions women's and men's basketball teams take on Hostess Community College tonight. But from WHPC Sports Talk and Brayton Daniello, Eric Williams, I am Joshua Yamahi thanking you once again for listening to the voice of Nassau Community College. 90.3 WHPC.